Okay, just real quickly, before we pray and go on, I have to tell you this. In 1978, when your parents were just being born, uh, there was a radio station called Trans World Radio, and it was in Bonaire, an island, and it was in Monte Carlo, like the Formula Race, and which is in Europe, you know, on the coast and Riviera there. And Trans World Radio was at the forefront of getting the gospel into the world, and they, their studios broadcast the Bible and evangelistic messages in every language of the world, and they timed, you know, how they bounced it in so it would go to the countries at the right time. And for decades, they'd been doing this since World War II, they kept track of everyone that responded. And I was in college, just like you, in 1978, and I got an a invitation. I had been supporting a guy named Brother Andrew and uh, sending him money, and uh, he wrote a book. You've probably heard of it, God Smuggler. And he used to write me letters, and he invited me to go on a trip with him to take Bibles in. So I got all excited, and, and I started raising money to go smuggling Bibles. And it was my junior year in college, and I was all excited. And then it turned out that Brother Andrew's group was going in a country that I didn't have a visa to, so I had to jump to another group. So I didn't go with Brother Andrew, even though you know, I supported him, we were friends, and we wrote, and all that stuff. So I went with a German outfit, and they told me that I was gonna go with seven German-speaking students, and I would be the only English speaker, and they were going to deliver a Bible to every person in all the Islamic countries that had written to Transworld Radio. But they said it's a very hard mission because 6,000 people have written to us. We have 6,000 Arabic Bibles. We have wrapped all 6,000 Arabic Bibles in brown paper and tied string on them. All of them are ready to be mailed, but we have to take them into the easiest Arabic country to get into, which is Morocco. And so they said, you have to drive, you have to go with the team and drive this trailer and this Mercedes bus with the trailer with 6,000 wrapped up Bibles inside brown grocery bags in the trailer. And they said, but you have to cross the border into Morocco where they search you, and if they find it, you will go to jail. I mean, when you're a junior in college, sounds like fun, right? Doesn't that sound exciting? And so we did, the eight of us. We drove 6,000 kilometers to deliver 6,000 Bibles, and we crossed, I mean, the most beautiful, I could describe it all day, uh, I mean, crossed, crossed Switzerland on the highways, crossed France, the Costa de la Sol of Spain, go to Malaga and go to, I mean, we were at Gibraltar. We crossed at Gibraltar, and, and finally, I was the driver. That's why I was on the team, because I, I was a truck driver before I went to school, and so I just was a driver, and so I drove, and, and um, had drove so much that it was fun. And I could tell you stories about that all day, but we got to the border, and we got in, and it was totally a miracle because the Lord timed our getting there. By the way, we parked in our car with 6,000 Bibles in it, and everybody was sweating. All of them were figuring how long before their mother would die because they were in prison and never contacted her again. You know, everyone was thinking all this stuff. Me, I was driving, and I was watching, and I could see six cars in front of us. In the front car, they opened the trunk, they opened the hood, they opened all the doors, they took out the seats, they unbolted the seats of the car and took them out. They took the carpet out, and they were looking for stuff. They were looking for smuggling. And I thought, you don't have to unbolt anything. Just open the back door and you'll see 6,000 Bibles. And then I thought, wait a minute. Every one of those Bibles has a person's name written in Arabic and their home address. Do you realize Trans World Radio was risking every known contact in the Arab world that had any questions about Christianity? They were, per I mean, who thought of that, you know? Of course, I'm a college kid. You just do what you're told. And so I was sitting there thinking, I said, Lord, if they even opened the back door, 6,000 not even saved people. Now, remember I said angels don't lead churches. What do angels do? You remember what it says in the last verse of Hebrews chapter 1? It says, aren't angels ministering spirits who watch over those who shall be heirs of salvation? You know what one of the things angels do? They protect people that haven't gotten saved yet that God knows are going to respond to the gospel. That's interesting. So I'm not teaching Hebrews, so I'll just say that. 
But I'm saying, Lord, I'm a little concerned about these 6,000 people that are going to get put in jail. And so I was having this thought, and I was holding all eight of the passports because the driver, I'd watched the scene. I mean, they're wearing machine guns. They're wearing these dark uniforms with those French-looking hats, the Moroccan, you know, uh, and they march up with their machine gun and say something, and everybody gets out of the car, and the driver hands the passports. I had seen it. You know, when they get all done with taking the car apart, they hand back the passports and they drive away into Morocco. So I'd watched car one, car two, we were car six, car three, car four. By the time we got to car five, they were sticking wires into the gas tank, trying to see if anything's floating in there that they're smuggling in. They're on rollerboards underneath the car, looking under, like at the exhaust pipes. These soldiers are doing that. And I thought, they don't have to do any of that to us. I mean, we're this giant long bus and then this trailer full of garb or brown paper bags to the ceiling. Do you know how many 6,000 Bibles? That's a lot. So, come up to the border gate, my turn, put it in park, had my... Um, passports in my hand, reached to the handle and went, the door wouldn't open. I thought, oh, they're going to think I'm resisting, you know, inspection. So I started pushing and it gave a little. And then I went like this and I looked over, you know, over the window and looked. The soldier had his knee like this. He was holding my door shut. He was like this going, so I thought, what is he looking at? And I looked over, and it was 11.59. And the second hand was going on the clock. Did you know clocks weren't digital in the old days? They actually had hands that pointed at numbers. You probably None of you have ever seen one of those. A clock. Look in a museum. And so here's this clock. And he's, he's looking, holding my door shut. I mean, I had the passports almost touching his face. And as soon as it hit 12, there was this bzzz, and all the soldiers and the new crew. And I'm still in the car. And the soldier gets up and he goes, you know how long a Mercedes bus is and that trailer? And he was, boy, was he crisp. You know, he had his new uniform on. And he just said, Americans, never even let us get out of the car. We drove in. So I said, this is going to be a great trip. We're already having supernatural protection. They took six, five cars apart in front of me. And because the Lord timed us to be at 1159. Well, what about this guy? Well, Transworld Radio knew there were six born-again Christians in Morocco in 1978. And they said, there's one in the city of Fez, F-E-S, Fez. You can look it up on the map, Fez, McNez, Casablanca, all these wonderful cities. And so we drove in to Fez. But they said, we can't tell you his address because if they captured you, they would kill him because he is the person that receives these 6,000 Bibles and he knows how to get them distributed. So he's the most important person for the Lord in Morocco. So we're not going to tell you his address. I said, oh, great. How many people live in Fez? They said, oh, I don't know, for, you know, 125,000. They said, but if the Lord wants you to get the Bibles to him, you'll find him. I said, oh, good. You know, I'm just a dumb American college student driving a van with seven other uh, sitting ducks, you know, around Morocco with 6,000 illegal contrabands. To make a long story short, instantly, and don't think this happens to everyone all the time because it's never happened to me before, but I was driving. I said, hey, what do you guys think we should do? And one of the people said, we should pray. So we all just parked inside the country on the outside of Fez, and we prayed. And when we all had finished praying, one person said, boy, I know where we're supposed to go. I said, really? You know where he is? They go, ah. And, and we started driving, and all of a sudden another one says, uh, it's that road. And so I was the driver. Do you know anything about Moroccan cities? They look like the old city of Jerusalem, if you've been there yet. 
the roads got narrower and narrower, the buildings started closing in, and I'm the driver, and I knew I could not back up very far with that trailer behind me, and, and it was starting to get narrow enough that I was having them pull in the mirrors, and each person said, one by one, it's, I'm sure we're supposed to go this way. And we'd drive a little bit, and none of them had any other peace. And finally, the last one says, I think we should go this way. And the road had gotten so narrow, we were in the souk. You know what that is? That's the central market. And we pulled into the town square, and it was my turn, because I was the eighth person. And I said, well, I have no feelings about what we're supposed to do, so I'm going to park, and we should pray again. And so we all bowed our heads in this big Mercedes bus with the trailer in front of the market. And at the instant we bowed our heads, you know what that is, the call to prayer. Morocco is very uh, observant Muslim country. I mean, people came from everywhere. Most of them wearing the complete black you know, outfit. It was just like, it just looked like you wouldn't believe it. it was just a wave of black outfitted people because we had not only parked at the market, it was the, the central mosque of Fez. And they were all streaming by us and they crawled over the trailer hitch. They were brushing against the trailer. They were brushing against the front of the Mercedes. And it was like a river of black humanity, you know, black garbed humanity. And we were just all sitting there like this, when all of a sudden, a face came up to my window and went. And I looked, and this big smiling face, he said, I can't believe it, in English. He said, I was up on my knees. He said, I live, we were parked here, mosque is here, market's here. He said, I live in the third floor right there. He said, how did you know where I lived? I said, <laughs> don't ask me. And he said, I was on my knees, and as I got up from my knees, I looked out, and he said, I'd been praying, and he said, Lord, if they're ever going to deliver, they're going to have to deliver during the call to prayer, because everyone will be in the mosque, and no one will see them. It's the only time it will work. And he said, when I got up from my knees, he said, I saw the most obvious, gigantic, European, you know, outfit. He said, nobody drives those into the inner city. He said, you get stuck down here. And he said, I knew it was you guys. And he said, we have exactly, you know, 15 minutes while they're in there, all of them on their faces and they're, you know, on their prayer rugs and everything that they're doing in the mosque. He said, if you can get all those bags up here and leave. And we did. And I thought, what can God do with a person who loves the Lord more than their life? For a person who was one of six in the whole country, who was willing to go to jail and probably have his hands cut off, you know, for bringing the infidels' Bibles in. The praying man of Morocco, and I don't know his name. Of course, he wouldn't tell us his name. But I will never forget seeing just what, what he, with his face, he went, if the perfect arrival and delivery could have been set up, only God could do that. See, that is just, in my life, in 1978, was one small slice of a reminder of what God can do. And that's from someone that knows what God's plan is for the church. God's plan is for the church that we do what God called us to do and love him more than anything else so that he can do something with us that, that no one else could do because that's what he does. And uh, that's the plan he has for you. And now, the book of Revelation is about how it all ends. Do you know, this is our final time today, our fifth lesson. Did you know there's actually a time where the church of Jesus Christ almost went extinct? And that is what we're going to see as we're starting to look. The second church, we've looked at, at Ephesus right there. See Patmos, you can see the little pink thing in that island is Patmos. And then you see the, the first one, Ephesus. Just north of Ephesus is Smyrna. And that's where we're going to be in chapter 2, uh, verses 8 to 11. So I started and I spent my half hour in Smyrna. And this is what I found. So look in your Bible at Acts, I mean Acts, uh, 
Revelation, that's where we were last, Acts, but Revelation 2, starting verse 8. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna. Now take the S off. Myr. Does that sound like any word you know in the Bible? Jesus at his birth had gold, frankincense, and what? Smyrna. That's actually how they say it. We say myrrh. They say Smyrna. He's going to the place named after the spice you put on people's bodies when they're dead. Isn't that interesting? This letter was written to people facing death for Christ. Okay, so look what Jesus says. To the angel, the messenger, the pastor, the elder of the church of embalming fluid. That's how we'd say it in English. You know, at the funeral home, that's what they put into people so that you can have them in a casket with an open casket. They put in embalming fluid. So you live at the, tr- at the city of embalming fluid. It sounds kind of, you know. But to them, these things says the first and the last. Now, how does Jesus, remember I told you every letter is to a city and then Jesus chooses a way to introduce himself that ends up being very important to the message of the letter. So what's, what does he say in verse 8? These things says the first and the last, who was what? And came to, thank you. Jesus is identifying with them. What were they facing? Death. What were they hoping on the other side of death would be? Endless life. And Jesus said, hey, I, w- I did it. I've already gone through the whole thing. I even had myrrh put on me. And you're from Smyrna. Isn't that neat? Only Jesus understands all our struggles, I wrote in my journal. He describes himself as dead and alive, as they were facing fatal persecution. Jesus knows what we're facing, and he's going to help us. He's going to help us. He said, that's, that's my whole focus? I'm the coach. I'm on the floor with you. I'm in the game. I'm beside you. You don't even know it a lot of times. You don't even pay attention to me much of the time. But I'm right there. And I'm committed to making... He that began a good work, Philippians 1.6, will bring it to perfection. Jesus is going to finish what he started. He said, so don't worry. If you're going to go through all the way to death, don't worry, I'm with you. Hey, I've done 350 funerals. I love doing funerals. It's one of the greatest places to encourage the saints and share the gospel. You know what I always say? Well, we've come here to say farewell to so-and-so but I know exactly where Jesus Christ was. And I I say, in room 509 of whatever general hospital, at 7 p.m., Jesus showed up. How do I know that? Because he said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death through David, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Jesus promises he's going to walk every believer. Before they go through the valley, before they enter the valley, he gets them and walks them through. So I said, you know what? Jesus showed up at the bedside of Sister So-and-So in room 509 of the hospital while everybody was over and they were doing the boards and, you know, checking the monitors and what they didn't see was Jesus was saying. And she sat up, the real her. The tent stayed behind. She sat up and heard for the first time the voice she knew so well of her good shepherd and And she just couldn't believe it. And she's looking around and seeing everybody in a flurry and the tubes and everything. And he said, come on. And he walks us. Did you know whoever lives and believes in me, Jesus said in John 11, 25 to 27, will never die? We don't ever die. Our body does. We don't. We don't cease to be consciously existing. We see Jesus. And he walks us through. So Jesus said, hey, I'm your greatest sympathizer. I know what's going on. Look at, look at verse 9. I know your works. I know your tribulations. You're getting squashed. I know your poverty, but you're really rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews. I know you're getting verbal abuse. I know you're getting physical abuse. I know, I know it all. I'm your greatest sympathizer. Now, if you're flying over, like this is a picture out the window of an airplane. This is Izmir. This is one of the most beautiful cities in Turkey. 
Izmir is what they call Smyrna of Bible times. It's, it's still there, the whole city. In fact, you see the yellow, see the tall kind of green building, and you see the big yellow circle? That is the first century Agora Forum of Smyrna. It's, it's a park. You can go to it. In fact, if you go, all of you that have been on, on the Seven Churches tour of Turkey, that you were there inside that yellow line. But you know what the second church, the message is? How does God want us to respond to fear, pain, and struggles, especially when they appear are going to be fatal? Well, if you go inside that circle, so I'm taking you on a tour. By the way, I love doing this. I've, I've taken 2,500 people to the lands of the Bible. I love doing that. Um, in fact, today, I'm taking 467 people through the lands of the Bible. Today, I'm doing it. Because every week I release another segment on YouTube and they actually go with us through this place. So I'm going to take you through Smyrna right now. You're right now, as you're looking at that picture, you're walking through the arched way into the Agora, into the Forum, into the marketplace, into the heart of Smyrna, of Christ's time, of Revelation 2, 8 through 11 time. Why are we bothering to do that? Because it helps you understand the message of this letter. Smyrna was one of the early adopters of the worship of Domitian. Remember Domitian? I told you he built the largest place. In fact, one of these days, if I get enough time, uh, I was just teaching a group and I took him to Domitian's palace and I talked to them and someone captured it on their cell phone. I'm gonna, if I can find it, I'm going to show it to you one of these days so you can actually be in Domitian's house. But Domitian wanted to be worshipped as a god. And so he he offered to the provinces favors if they would force the citizens to bow to him. So he sent all these busts of himself, you know, a statue, and they would put it in the Agora. And so Smyrna agreed to do it. They wanted whatever, you know, it's kind of like in our Congress, you know, if you'll go along with it, they'll build a park in your town, you know, all these perks that taxpayer money goes to. Imperial money went to everybody that adopted emperor worship. And so the leaders of Smyrna did it, and all it involved was bringing the town people in a narrow single file into the Agora, and right there on the right, uh, there would have been the city clerk, and the city clerk had the roster of all the Roman citizens, and all the Roman citizens had to walk by. You told them their name, they found your name, they put a check mark, and next to the city clerk was a little tiny bowl. Now imagine how many people lived in Smyrna, thousands. So can you imagine how long the line was? And so you would be in this line, and no one actually could see what you were doing, because they're all behind you, and you walk up there to the city clerk, and the city clerk would ask you your name, they'd check it off, and you'd reach your fingers into a little bowl of incense, and next to the clerk was a little oil lamp with its flame going, and all you had to do is take the incense, you pinch the little powder, and just go like that, and, and it would, the incense powder, when it hit the flame of the oil lamp, would go, you know, like little flaming sparkles, like, you know, put sugar over a flame, and it'll burn, you know. It's the same thing with incense, and a little puff of smoke. And the soldier standing there, the centurion, the legionnaire, would hand you a little tiny slip of paper. It was called a labelli. It was a certificate that you were, you were legit, you know, a good emperor-worshipping citizen. Nobody said anything. Domitian was right there. You were offering worship to him. You were, you were saying, I worship you. You're a god. Or you were saying, you're a dummy. But you didn't say it out loud. You just did it because you wanted to get that slip. If you didn't do it at that moment, they cuffed you. You were not good. And you went to jail. Didn't know if you'd ever see your family. They ended up burning the pastor of Smyrna, who was 86 years old, because he wouldn't do it. They burned him at the stake. Hey, everybody's standing behind me. Nobody can see what I'm doing. Just walk through. Say, sorry, Jesus. Don't mean to do this. See, you could, you could have the best of both worlds. And that's what was going on in the church. And there was what's called the, the lapsed 
Christian, lapse, like L-A-P-S-E, lapsing, not fully following Christ because people were so afraid to be burnt at the stake. So that's why Jesus said, don't fear those things which you're about to suffer. Don't, don't fear, I already died, I'm going to be with you. Jesus walks us through our life of trials. Well, this is just the beginning. Nero, remember, started the persecution in 54, 68 and kind of swept up the Apostle Paul and swept up the Apostle Peter. And, you know, Paul was executed as a Roman. Peter was actually crucified in Nero's stadium. Nero had a a circus, actually. It was a horse race track. It's in Rome today. Everybody, everybody has seen where Peter was executed because the centerpiece of that execution was an obelisk from Egypt And that's where he was executed, in that chariot race arena. And do you know what they built all the way around it? It's called the Vatican. It's called St. Peter's. And so you've seen where Peter was martyred, and Paul was probably out uh, by the 13th mile marker or wherever where they did the Romans. Domitian now is the second big persecutor. He's the one that exiles John. But look, I mean, Trajan, Marcus Aurelius, that's the one that... uh, you know, gladiator movies about Marcus Aurelius and Septimus Severus and Maximus and Decius, Valeria Aurelian. But then we get the worst one. And that's when Christianity almost, almost got to the end. I call it the near extinction of Christianity. Nero started it. He was sporadic. He was, Nero had problems. I mean, he murdered his own mother. He murdered his wife. Uh, Historians tell us when he was a little kid that he got a frying pan. He used to have, he was rich. He was one of, uh, of Augustus Caesar's you know, relatives, so he was very wealthy. He would have street urchins collect flies for him. He would hold the fly, pull its wings off, and drop it in the pan and see how long it could run around the pan over the fire before the fire killed it. That's what he did as a child. He liked to hurt things. He bought big sandals and had spikes on it, and when his wife was expecting and he didn't like her, he kicked her to death and you couldn't touch him. He was the emperor. So, I mean, he was bad. Domitian was a calculated killer. Then we get to Diocletian. He was an engineer. In fact, um, that I've never watched one, but the most famous cable thing, it was called, uh, I think, Game of Thrones or something, was the castle thing was filmed. That's, That's Domitian's palace. It's on the coast of the Adriatic Sea. It's, it's, his palace became a whole city on the coast that, that you know, they make movies in. But Diocletian started the most complete persecution of the church. He did three things. He was an engineer. Uh, he was great at, at doing things. He fixed all of Rome's sewers. He fixed the water. He fixed the bathhouses. And then he heard about the Christian problem. He said, well, in fact, he's the only emperor that retired. Every other Roman Empire either died of dissipation, was assassinated, or died in fight. Diocletian never lost any battles, never died in a fight. He never, no one wanted to assassinate him. He was such a good emperor. And he wasn't dissipated. He was very, an engineer. You know those engineer accounting types. They're very, you know, methodical. And he, when he got all done, he retired. And went to Dubrovnik, you know, that city where uh, the castle is. And But for his getting against Christianity, he said, there's three things you need to do to get rid of Christianity. He said, number one, get their holy book. So the legionnaires went out and they went through and ransacked every Christian's home and every church and they destroyed every complete copy of the Bible. Have you guys had your textual criticism and Bible survey class and found out that there is no complete manuscript of the Bible? That means one manuscript with all the books together in one place that predates Diocletian. Oh, there are many after Diocletian. He destroyed every one. So what did the Christians do? Same thing when I was in the communist countries. They would tear up their Bibles into pieces and they'd give this family Genesis and this family Exodus and this family Leviticus. And so if the communist police came, they only got one book and they had it spread all over the place. That's what the believers did. That's why there's so many manuscript fragments because of this time period. So... He got rid of all the Bibles. He didn't really, but he thought he did. Then he said, we are going to destroy every place that has a church meeting. And so any house or any building the church met in, the Roman legionnaires destroyed them under Diocletian. That's why 
you can't, I mean, in the Holy Land, you can't find any of these cathedrals that, that the ruins are there because they were all destroyed. Now, you can find them afterward, Constantine's time, like the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and all those, but, and the Church of the Nativity, but nothing before. Why? They destroyed them all. But the last thing he said, we're going to get rid of every pastor, every one of those messengers in Christ's hands. And they did. They either imprisoned them or killed them. It's the closest the church ever got to extinction. And all of you know what happened. Uh, as they were marching them out, I mean, this is one of the artists, you know, of the arena, the Colosseum, which is built over Nero's lake. Uh, they would march these people out there, and they'd say, if you don't renounce Christ, lion, eat you. And those legionnaires would watch Men, women, children, defenseless, torn to shreds. And they would die singing. They'd die looking up, praying. And they had this supernatural peace. Wow. What did Jesus say is going to help them do that? Well, he says, look at, at verse 8. Hey, I'm the one, I'm the first and the last. I was dead and I came to life. You're sharing in my sufferings. Uh, what, what did, uh, do you remember what Paul said in 2 Timothy 3.12? Yea, all that are godly in Christ Jesus. Is that second or first? I might have a typo here. 2 Timothy 3. Oh no, it's right. 2 Timothy 3.12. Yea, all that are godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Not some. All. You know what's interesting if you read the whole letter to the Smyrnans, Smyrnians? He doesn't promise they'll escape with their lives. You know, we love the, the happy ending movies where at the last minute they get rescued. Jesus said, be faithful unto death and I'll give you a crown of life. L look, look what he says. Uh, he who has an ear, verse 11, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches if you overcome, you'll not be hurt by the second death. Back up to verse 10. Don't fear any of those things that you're about to suffer. The devil's going to throw some of you into prison. You're going to be tested. You'll have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful until death. I'm not going to rescue you. And I'll give you a crown of life. Wow. What's the lesson? I wrote in my journal. Throughout history, God has used the persecution of his church to advance the gospel. What, what did the Lord want them to do? Number one, in verse 10, Jesus said, Do not fear. Do you know what the most repeated negative prohibition in the Bible is? What does God say, don't do that most? Fear not. That's the most repeated negative prohibition in the Bible. Fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not. Why? Because God has not given us a spirit of fear. That's what Paul told Timothy. So what's the realm of fear? Who runs the fear realm? Satan. And see, when, when we can get paralyzed by fear, when we live in fear, that's what's so wrong. It seems like Christianity, none of you are old enough to remember, but we went through this Y2K thing. It was called Y2K. And all the Christians thought the world was going to end. And so what did the Christians do? I don't mean all of them. I mean a vast majority of them. Well, I was pastoring in Oklahoma, and I know what a lot of people did. They bought way out in the country places. They stocked them with diesel and generators and enough grain to feed 200 people for 400 years. And they dug wells, and they had gold and machine guns, and you wouldn't believe the stuff. I visited some of these places. In fact, I lost a dear friend because he invited Bonnie and me to come with our eight little children and come to his compound. But he said, once you come in on Thanksgiving, you can't leave until Y2K is over. I said, wait a minute. I said, if Y2K, you probably don't even know what Y2K was. They said all the computers at once were going to turn off and the electricity would stop and the water would stop and every plane would fall out of the air and the world would end. And I thought, wait a minute, I've already read about this in the Bible. And what we're supposed to be doing is running out there and trying to lead as many people to Christ as possible. How can you lead them to Christ if you're in your compound with machine guns to keep them out? And we lost that friendship. And they did go to their compound. And they did drop off the radar. And no one knew where they were. And they survived Y2K. 
but they lived in what Jesus most often tells us not to live in, fear. Don't fear. So, make a choice to stop fearing. Jesus understands that Satan uses fear, 2 Timothy 1.7. God doesn't give a spirit of fear. So Jesus shares the most repeated negative prohibition, fear not. Why? Because Jesus goes on to say, the devil can cause bad things to happen in our lives. God knows how much we can endure. You see, we learn that in Job. Do you remember Job 1 and 2? I'm sure you've already covered the book of Job. Job 1 and 2 is one of the greatest passages on the cosmic battle going on. And if I was teaching the book of Job, I'd tell you all about things Satan can do. Satan can affect the weather. He sent a tornado and destroyed the home where Job's ten kids were. It says a wind came out of the woods and destroyed the home. Who did that? Satan. Satan sent fire from heaven and destroyed Job's servants and the flocks. Satan can bring fire down from heaven. How do we know that? Read Revelation when you read it this week as your assignment. You're going to see that the false prophet can call down fire anytime he wants, and Satan can send fire. Do you know what that means? Signs and wonders don't just come from God. Remember how Moses said if someone does a sign or a wonder, don't believe them unless what they say aligns with the Bible? This is the proof, not the sign, not the wonder. This, the Word of God. Jesus limits Satan's harm to us. But Jesus asks us if we would be willing to lose our earthly temporal life in exchange for permanent heavenly life. Now remember, it's kind of like the whole argument. I do a lot of Q&As. I love doing Q&As uh, where people ask questions and I show them from the Bible how to answer that. You know what one of the big ones is? Uh, is cremation okay or not? That's a big question. I, in fact, I think I know the top 100 because I've heard them. Questions. Do you know what cremation is? Cremation is rapid rotting. <laughs> Human bodies rot. You know, they decay. When they're put in, well, after the formaldehyde wears off, gradually they decay in that box. So either you oxidize slowly in decay and going back to dust, or rapidly, rapid oxidization is called burning. Slow oxidization and decay is called rotting. And so I know that the pagans uh, cremate and all that, but basically the body's going back to dust, either fast or slow. So what I'm saying is we're all going to die except for those that are alive and remain at the coming of Christ. And so if you can choose between saving your life and saving all your stuff and moving to the compound and keeping everything safe while the world falls apart, Jesus said, whatever you hold on to to the end, you'll lose. But if you lose your life for my sake, you'll gain everything. And so that's what prompted Jim Elliott to go to the AUKUS. I mean, he knew he was probably going to die. If you ever heard of him, you know, through Gates of Splendor guy. That's, that's what made all these pioneer missionaries do what they did. Because they said either we're going to go the slow boat and rot or we're going to burn out. And so we're going to burn out. Now, God doesn't call everybody to that. And Jesus specifically said, if they persecute you in one place, flee to another place. He never said, stand there and be killed. But he said, don't deny me. So if they've, if they've chained you up and said, either deny Christ or die, you say, okay, I won't deny him, I'll die. But if they haven't chained you and they say, if you don't go through that line and worship Caesar, we're going to kill you, you can flee to another town. Your fleeing means that you confess Christ and you're able to share the gospel with them. So, see, Jesus limits Satan's harm to us, but we're supposed to, in our heart, be willing to lose everything. How do we do that? I mean, verse 11, if you overcome, you'll not be hurt by the second death. How it says it in Hebrews 7.16, I love Hebrews 7.16, we live after the power of an endless life. I like how my mentor, John McCarthy, used to say it. When he flew on airplanes all the time, like Bonnie and I do, you know what he used to tell the person next to him? He would sit there studying his Bible, and the person would say, what are you doing? He says, he says it's a good thing you're on this airplane with me because it's not going to crash because I know God's not done with me yet. The person would say, what did you just say? He says, good thing you're on this airplane with me because it's not going to crash because God's not done with my life yet. I know that I have to finish teaching through the whole Bible, so it's not going to crash. I wouldn't do that. That's a crazy thing to do, but that's how... 
assured he was that he had been called to Grace Community Church to preach through every verse of the Bible. And he just finished recently, so I expect his plane to crash, you know. But, uh, you know, what's amazing is that we live after the power of an endless life. We, we will live forever. Now, real quickly, ooh, we're on 16. I have to tell you about one more friend of mine. Remember I told you I delivered Bibles, so I didn't just do it in Northern Africa. Another summer, in 79, I led a whole team from my college, Bible college. I recruited kids, and I, Bonnie was actually in the chapel uh, and I, I was asking kids to go on this team with me. I had not met her yet. And uh, I wouldn't have gone on the team if I'd have known her. But uh, I, I got this team, and we took 50,000 Bibles into Behind the Iron Curtain. One trip. I'll tell you about one trip. We would lo- load them into these vans. These were more sophisticated. They actually had a movable floor. These were professional smuggling vehicles and they would loop the floor, and you'd stick the Bibles, one Bible high, the entire frame of the car. It was beautifully engineered in Switzerland and everything, but a, a car could hold 1,800 Bibles, and we packed them and prayed for each one and put them in, and then we would shut the thing, and we'd go through the border and just pray that they wouldn't find them. And our teams never lied. Other teams, there was another mission where they taught them how to look right in the eye and say, no, we don't have Bibles until you didn't flinch. And I said, I don't want to be on that team because God doesn't bless lying. And so I went on the team where we were willing to go to jail. And so we got our Bibles and we got to Romania. That's where all the Ukrainians are going these days. It's right over there on the Black Sea, right by the Ukraine. And they told us the way we delivered our Bibles, that we would pull up in front of a factory at 5 p.m. and one of the workers would come right out and not say a word and get in the front seat of our car And that worker was Boaz, and he would take us, show us where the churches were, and we would deliver the Bibles. And you know where they put them? Inside haystacks. You ever seen like the Wizard of Oz where, uh, you know, Dorothy's on top of the haystack, you know, or whatever? I don't, is that in there? I don't know. But you know, those big haystacks that are giant were hollowed out inside. They built rooms in them. They had doors, and they put hay over it so you couldn't see it. And we would drive up in the middle of the night, and they'd move the hay, and they'd open the door, and we'd put all 1,800 Bibles in there. It was really a neat way to smuggle Bibles. The first trip, remember, we took 50,000. Boaz shows up, jumps in the car. He tells us where to go. He's sleeping like this, and I look over at his hands. His fingernails were this thick. You see how thick that is? People's fingernails are not that thick. They were also brown, dark brown, horrible. I thought, wow, he has eczema. You know, I I didn't know what it was. I asked the mission leader, I said, that guy we work with that doesn't talk much, I said, why are his fingers like that after the first trip? He said, oh, you don't know Boaz? I said, no, I don't know Boaz. He said, oh, he gets caught all the time. He said, only they don't kill him. The police... No, he helps us. So they tie his hand on a bench, you know, so just his fingers are sticking off. And the police chief takes a block of pine wood with his jackknife and makes slivers. And then he comes and he jams them underneath these these sharp pine thin, like toothpicks. He jams them under every fingernail. And then he pops out his lighter and he lights them all. And they burn, and it ruins your fingernails. It hurts, too. And they said, that's what they do to him. And I said, they've done it before? Oh, they said, they catch him every year. I said, and he goes through that every year? Have you ever gotten one tiny pine needle under your fingernail? Or anything? It really hurts. We pulled up in front of the factory the next day. We reloaded our car. We pulled up. Boaz gets in. I just about wanted to kiss that hand of his. I thought, I've never met someone whose faith in Christ overcame their fears. By the way, that summer, they stopped doing that to him. The next time we came, he didn't come out. They tied him to the bench, this time with his feet out, and they took a rubber garden hose And the police chief had his entire crew whap the bottoms of his feet 
with the garden hose. Do you know what happens if you hit the bottoms of your feet so long? It does something to your nerves where you no longer can stand up. And so it crippled him, the, the damage to the bottoms of his feet. We came back another year. I couldn't believe when I pulled up in front of the factory. Boaz. You see, his faith in Jesus Christ, believing that he could trade the temporal for the eternal, made him like the people of Smyrna. He said, life is camping. It's uncomfortable. You ever camped? You know, it's damp, and there are bugs, and there are if you don't have one of those nice, neat mats, it's bumpy and smook. You ever been outdoors and it rains? It's horrible. You would endure camping because heaven is home. Wow. Okay, we only have a few minutes to introduce the next church, which is Pergamum. It's in chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 12. By the way, that's what it looks like if you went there today. This is the main cardo, and you can see the columns going up along that ridge, and you can see, oh, that's the incredible theater that's at Pergamum. And where those two trees are, to the right of the theater, is where the seat of Satan is. It's an altar that's actually in the Berlin Museum. So we would look at that. But do you know what the problem of Pergamus was? In verse 12, Jesus tells him, to the angel of the church in Pergamus, Pergamos, interesting. These things says he who has a sharp two-edged sword. I know your works where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, that altar that was right there where those two uh, trees are. And you hold fast to my name. And you didn't deny the faith even in the days when Antipas was a faithful martyr. He was killed among you. Where Satan dwells. Oh, there's so much. If you guys picked this chapter, I hope you're seeing. I mean, did you know Satan moves around? He's not omnipresent. At that particular time in history, Jesus knows right where Satan is. He knows where all the demons are. He knows what they're, every false teacher, he knows what's going on. He says, right now, Satan is actually headquartering in your town because he liked that altar to Zeus that was right up there, the king of the gods. And Satan loves, he's proud, and he likes attention. But I have, verse 14, a few things against you because you have there in your church those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. Balaam? Remember, nothing new. Everything goes back to somewhere else in the Bible. Do you remember Balaam? Balaam's the one that went up and they slaughtered all those oxen, built the seven altars, and Balak wanted him to curse the children of Israel. And he said, I'll only say what God wants me to say. And he blessed Israel every time. You remember that story from the Old Testament? So they got mad at him. They got rid of him. They said, we're not going to pay you. And so when he got down from the mountain... He circles back around and he talks to him and we find out later that he told him, you can't beat God head on. You've got to come around the back door. He said, if you'll send all of your pretty girls out, they'll entice and seduce and get the attention of the little Israeli boys. And if you can get the, the, Bala, I mean, the Moabite girls to sneak in the camp and commit sexual immorality with the Jews, God will kill them for you. That's exactly what happened. That's what the doctrine of Balaam is. Infiltrate the church with immorality. Beware of secret sins. How many Christian leaders does it come out have all these horrible things in their life that they've hidden and then someone fixes their computer or you know an email gets out did you know the church has a lot of the doctrine of Balaam in it where Christians allow secret sins to creep into their lives? What happened? Well, believers compromise Christ's call to personal holiness. They got comfortable around sin. And as believers, as God's own people, how can you be comfortable around what God hates? By the way, what happens if you do that? Well, we're going to have to go. But when we come back, I'm going to talk about this. Do you remember Samson? Samson was killed by God as he pushed down those pillars. And Paul comments on it.